If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 126. Psalm 126. After service, let me encourage you guys to interact with Sean, hear his story, connect with him, get on his email list so you guys will know how to pray for him and um, how um, you guys can stay connected with him. Psalm 126 is our text. Let me read it for you, and then we will dive into the word this morning. Verse 1, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Verse 4, restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. This morning we're continuing our series in the book of Psalms. We're taking a break from our regular series in Hebrews, and we're just looking at some familiar chapters in the book of Psalms and um, encouraging us. These are not deep passages that we're looking at. These are just passages that are meant to encourage, challenge us to keep our eyes on Jesus. And this psalm, for some of you guys, it's a familiar psalm. For others, it's um, a new psalm that you've never heard before. There's a, mount, there's a church in a remote Swiss village that was one of the most beautiful churches in the region. And one of the features about this church that attracted so many people to it was that in the middle of this church was a beautiful pipe organ. People would come from miles away to hear the lovely tunes of the organ. But one day the organ fell silent. It was making no more music. Musicians, experts would come from around the world trying to repair it, but no one succeeded. Then one day an old man appeared and asked permission to try and fix the organ. After working on it several days, the community once again was filled with glorious music. Farmers dropped their clothes, merchants closed their stores, everyone stopped what they were doing, headed to the church to hear the music again. And when the old man had finished playing, someone asked him how he was able to fix the organ. He said, 50 years ago, I was the one who came in here and built it. I created it. Now I have restored it. That's the message of the psalm that we're reading this morning. The story that we read is a story of that Jewish pilgrims wrote when they were going to Jerusalem to sing. As they, as they would walk, they would sing this song. It was read as a song of thanksgiving for deliverance from bondage and a prayer for the complete restoration of the people of God. We don't know who the author is. We don't know the occasion that prompted it. Verse 1 speaks of God restoring Zion's fortunes referring to any number of occasions when God delivered the people from bondage. The word that's used there in verse 1 is also used in Job 42, where it talks about how God restored the fortunes of Job. And you know his story, how he lost everything. But in the end, God restores it. Psalm 126 is about a misfortune that happened in Jerusalem, but God restored his people. This chapter speaks to us and reminds us that you can face anything that life throws at you because you know that God has intervened in your past, and if he's intervened in your past, you can know that he will intervene today, and you can know he will intervene tomorrow. The writer of this psalm looks back to consider everything that God has done for them, and he looks forward with confidence that God can do it again. Verses 1 to 3 of this psalm focuses on a sovereign and gracious act of God. The Lord restores the fortunes of Zion. The emphasis of this verse is not on what happened or when it happened. The emphasis of this verse is on who did it. The Lord restored the fortunes of Zion. Whatever historical event this psalm celebrates, it was not the result of the wise decision of a king. It was not the result of the heroic acts of soldiers. It was not even the spiritual devotion of the people of God. God did it. God restored the people, and God restored them back to their land. The same is true of us this morning. It is the Lord's blessings that we enjoy today. 
Psalms 115 verse 1 says, Not to us, O Lord, not to us but to your name be the glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. We can live and we can serve God with great expectations as we look back and consider everything that God has done for us. It is the goodness, the grace, and mercy of God that we are sitting here this morning. The Lord did it. The Lord has done good things for us. The Jews would sing this song in reference to some act of divine intervention in their life. But when we as believers read this Old Testament text through New Testament eyes, we can see the divine intervention that God has done on our behalf because of Jesus. The Lord has restored our fortunes. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It continues, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. God has done good things for us. God has. It is enough that he saved us from the penalty of sin. If you're a believer this morning, you sit here and you know God saved you, that you don't have to spend eternity without Him, eternity in hell. That's more than enough for us to praise Him. But James 1.17 says that every good and perfect gift is from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. The Lord keeps doing good things for us. It's not that he's just did something in the past, but he keeps over and over and over doing good things for us. And our text gives us two things that God has done for us. Number one, he turns our dreams into reality. Verse one, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. The people of God prayed so hard, cried so much, waited so long for things to change that when God intervened, they could not even believe it. It was more than just a dream come true. It was a dream that they would not even dare to dream. It was, as Ephesians says, far more abundantly than all that we could ask or think. God blew their minds away. They were like the church in Acts that were praying for Peter to be delivered from bondage. The church was sitting and they were praying in the secret room, praying that God would deliver Peter. And God miraculously delivers Peter and Peter comes, knocks on the door, and they don't even believe that God delivered him. It was beyond their dream. Listen, when God answers our prayers, it is way beyond we could ever dream or think. In fact, this is one of the ways that you can know whether it was God or it was you. If you can explain what happened, God didn't do it. The Lord turns dreams into reality. Not only does he turn dreams into reality, the verse says he turns sorrow into joy. Verse 2 records two results of God's restoration of Zion's fortress. The first result was joy. Verse 2, our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. The statement here describes the dramatic way that God restored the fortunes of Israel. In Psalm 137, if you flip over there, the story is completely different. They're sitting in Babylon, sitting in bondage, not knowing if they'll ever be free. And the people of Babylon are telling these Jews to sing a song, and they're saying, how can we sing when we're going through so much pain? How can we sing when we're going through so much struggle? How can we sing when we don't know what our future holds? They're they're telling them to sing when they have no song in their mouth. They were defeated, they were depressed, they were demoralized when it deemed it was impossible and wrong for them to sing. But when God restored the fortunes of Zion, their mouths were filled with laughter, their tongues with shouts of joy. That's how good God is. The Lord is so good that you have to have a smile on your face. The Lord is so good that you should be filled with laughter. That's what happened to Sarah in Genesis 21, Genesis 18. God shows up and tells Abraham, Abraham, you're going to have a son. And Abraham says, I'm too old to have a son. Sarah's in the other room listening, and Sarah begins to laugh. God rebukes them and says, is anything too hard for me? And just a few chapters over, God 
gives them a son, and Sarah conceives, and Abraham bears a son. They name him Isaac, and his name means laughter. And Sarah says, God has created laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh and rejoice. God is so good that it ought to make you smile. God is so good that your life should be filled with, so, with, filled with joy. An unbelieving woman once came to Charles Spurgeon, the preacher, and said, Pastor Spurgeon, if God ever does save me, he'll never hear the end of it. She was being sarcastic, but isn't that the truth? He has saved you, helped you, delivered you, strengthened you, healed you, set you free. You should never let him hear the end of it. Psalms 30, verse 11 and 12 says, You turned my mourning into dancing. You've loosened my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness, that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. My God, I will give thanks to you forever. Listen, some of you, you've forgotten how good he is. You've forgotten how faithful he is. When you remember what God has done, there should be joy in your life. It doesn't matter what you're going through today. He has been good before. He will be good tomorrow. He will be faithful. Not only does he do good things for you, but the psalmist declares he has done great things for us. The first result was that they were full of joy. But there's a second result. Verse 2 says that they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The significance of this verse is found in who says it. It wasn't the people of God that was saying that God has worked on their behalf. It was the nations, unbelieving people, people that did not know God, people that wanted nothing to do with God, was saying God is working on their behalf. People that, it was referring to unbelieving people in the world who worshipped idols, defied God, hated the people of God. Yet when God began to work for his people, it was so great that the unbelieving world began to look and say, God has done great things for them. Listen, lost people should acknowledge the great things that God has done. Not only lost people, but we should acknowledge great, the great things God has done. Verse 3 says, The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. You know, as I read this, I wish this statement came before verse 2. I wish we would acknowledge it first before the world acknowledges it. But the psalmist says the world acknowledges it first, then we acknowledge it. It seems kind of out of place that the nations would acknowledge the great things that God has done before the believers would. But do you realize that sometimes we fail to see the goodness of God right when we're in the middle of it? Sometimes we're going through difficulties and all we can see is the difficulty we're going through and we're not able to see all the ways that God has blessed us. We haven't seen all the ways that God has provided for us. We haven't seen all the ways that God has taken care of us. I'll never forget talking to someone, a friend, a mentor, and telling him how I was struggling with something. And he sat down and he said, well, God has provided for you. He's blessed you with a good family. He's blessed you with good kids. He's blessed you with a good home. He's blessed you with a good job. I was so focused on this one thing that was going wrong that I missed all of the other ways that God was blessing me. And sometimes we as believers, we forget that we're so focused on the one area of our struggles, the one area where it seems that things aren't going right, and we feel like God has forgotten us and abandoned us, but we forget that all around us is the blessings of God in our lives. He provides for us. He takes care of us. He gives us good health. He allowed us to see this day. He gives us a good family. He gives us good kids. He provides food on our table. He gives us shelter to love, live under. God has done great things for us. He has. Too often we're too busy seeing the darkness that we don't see his goodness. So let me advise you, let me encourage you this morning to see the great things that God is doing in your life. See that God has done it all. It wasn't because of how wise you were. It wasn't because of how good you were. God had been faithful to you every step of the way. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder Consider all the works thy hand has made. I see the stars. I hear the roaring thunder. Thy power throughout your universe display. 
Then sings my soul, my Savior, my God to thee. How great you are. How great you are. Listen, all of us in this room can look back and see that God has been good to us. We can count over and over and over the blessing, the protection, the provision of God in our lives. Not only can we look back and remember God's goodness, but we can look forward with confidence that God will take care of us. That's what verses 4 through 6 is about. In verse 4 to 6, in verses 1, the psalmist joyfully remembers that God has restored him. But in verse 4, the psalmist prays that God would fully restore Zion. Verse 4 is the only petition of this psalm. It's the only prayer that's in there. He goes from rejoicing in what God has done to now praying, God, would you continue to restore? It's a sudden and dramatic shift from joyful remembrance to a humble petition before God. Here's why. Joy doesn't last for a long time. It can't really, because life is filled with happiness and agony, good times and bad times, joy and suffering. I remember growing up and hearing my parents or others say that trouble doesn't always last for a long time. But like it or not, the truth is, our triumphs don't last always either. But we know that the God who restored us yesterday is able to do it again. And in verses 4 through 6, we see the affirmation of God's authority and the reminder of our personal responsibility in the process of restoration. What do you do when you're at life's traumatic point and you don't know where to turn? The psalmist says it in one word. You pray. That's all you do. This, verse 4 says, the psalmist prays and says, Restore my fortunes, O God. This is the only prayer in this psalm. And it's a simple request. God, restore my fortunes. The same terminology is used in verse 1. There it's a celebration of what God has done. But it's here it's used as a prayer for future restoration. Literally, the psalmist prays, God, you've done it before. Will you do it again? God, you provided before. Will you provide again? God, you healed before. Will you heal again? God, you restored before. Will you restore again? The Lord has restored Israel to their land and given them back everything they've lost. But now they need God to provide for them spiritually. And here's the reality of life. There will be times where you need restoration after restoration. There will be times where you need God to deliver you to something after he's delivered you from something. You'll need God to bring you into a new season after he's brought you into a new time period in your life. You will need to heal God to heal you even though the doctor says you are healthy. You will need God to give you a stimulus package even when your finances are in order. But the good news is that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The one who restored you in the past is faithful to restore you in the future. Notice how the psalmist describes this restoration. Verse 4 says, Restore our fortunes like streams in the Negev. Negev was in the deep south of, Ju of Judah. It was a desert land. During the summer, there would be no rain, and it would be bone dry. There was no water. But suddenly, there would be rain would fall in the winter, and this desert would overflow its bank with waters. The dramatic picture reveals that God is able to turn things around in a heartbeat. Just because it's dry today, doesn't mean it's not going to be filled with water tomorrow. Just because you're barren today doesn't mean God cannot miraculously provide for you tomorrow. The Lord can bring water from a rock. He can turn desert into a river. He can turn, bring streams into the desert. The Lord can do what he wants to do. Isaiah 41 says, When the poor and needy ask for water, then there is none, and their tongue is parched with thirst. I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers on the bare heights and the fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make wilderness a pool of water and dry land springs of living water. God can miraculously provide for you. In an instant, he can turn your desert into floods of living water. But verse 5 and 6, the picture begins to shift. And now he uses this agricultural allegory to describe the process of sowing and reaping. 
Verse 4 tells us that God can bring restoration instantly. Verse 5 and 6 tells us there are times where God will bring restoration over a process, over a period of time. Streams in the desert are a sovereign work of God alone. Only God can turn a desert into a river. But sowing and reaping requires a partnership between us and God. Our personal responsibility is acknowledged in the principle of the harvest. Verse 5 and 6 says, Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed of sowing, shall come with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. This verse encourages us to look past the sorrow of sowing and look forward to the success of reaping. Look past the sorrow of sowing. Verse 5 says, Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. Think about a farmer who's suffered a drought last season. He sowed his seeds, but because there was no rain, his entire investment was lost. And when time comes to plant again, he only has a limited amount of seed left. And last season's crop failure left him unable to purchase more crops. So he sows what he has. He has no cho- choice. But as he sows, tears begin to flow from his eyes. And the psalmist says, those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. Notice the intermediate process of so- between sowing and reaping. That's not mentioned at all. The process of waiting, the process of trusting that something will come up, that's not mentioned. That's omitted. The verse starts at the beginning, leaps all the way to the end. The farmer sows in tears, then he reaps with shouts of joy. This little proverb is filled with hope. It reminds us that no matter how difficult the present season may be, if you trust God with the seed that you have sown, a harvest is on its way. The psalmist writes, For his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Not only do you look past the sorrow of your sowing, but you look forward to the success of your reaping. Verse 6 says that he who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. The verse emphasizes the proverb from verse 5. Here the psalmist describes one who sows in tears as going out and weeping, bearing the seed of sowing. Seed of sowing is precious or costly seed. There's a famine in the land. The ground is unresponsive. The farmer's family is hungry. The seed can be used to make bread and feed his family. But the farmer has taken a step of faith and decided to take the seed and sow it into the ground, into unresponsive ground, trusting that God will provide for him, trusting that God will take care of his family, trusting that God will feed his family. But as the farmer considered the risks that he's taking in planting his seeds, sowing his precious, costly seed, he weeps as he goes out. Verse 6 says that he comes home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. The language there indicates only one trip. The farmer goes out weeping to sow his precious seed into unresponsive soil. But while he is at the field, God intervenes and works. And by the time he gets home, God has brought the harvest to him. The verse describes a miracle that declares that there is nothing too hard for God. No matter what you're going through in life, no matter what situation you're facing, no matter how big it is, there's nothing too hard for our God. He's faithful. He always has been. He always will be. And you can look back on your own life and you could say, There have been times over and over and over where I had nowhere to turn, but God had provided. And I can sit here today with the praise on my mouth because I know he's provided for me back then. I can face tomorrow knowing he will provide for me then. God is faithful. There are times in our lives where you sow and you work and you toil and you see no result. The psalmist encourages us, don't give up, don't quit. In due season, the harvest is coming. 
spiritually speaking, as we intervene in the lives of people and we share gospel in the lives of people. Some of you have been investing into people's lives and you feel like it's barren. You feel like there's no fruit coming. This verse reminds us, keep loving them. Keep pouring into them. Don't give up. The harvest will come in God's timing. There will be times where you find that your faith is tested. Your love is rejected. Your kindness unappreciated. Your labor criticized. Your sacrifice is forgotten. Don't give up. Though you may go, home, go out weeping, the Bible says you'll come home rejoicing. Listen, this morning, the ultimate proof that God can restore you is Jesus himself. While we were the enemies of God, while we hated him, when we wanted nothing to do with him, God sent his son Jesus into the world to take people that wanted nothing to do with God and converting them from enemies to making them children of God. This morning, the ultimate proof that God can restore you is that you are a believer, a child of God. In a few moments, we are going to come to the table. We are going to celebrate the faithfulness and the goodness of God in our lives. We're going to celebrate that God saved us, redeemed us, rescued us when we did not deserve it. It wasn't because we were good. It wasn't because we were perfect. It wasn't because we had everything right. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Some of you this morning, you need to be reminded that though you weep today, God will bring shouts of joy and dancing into your life. God is faithful. He will provide. He will protect. He will take care of you. This morning, some of you need to hear this. Some of you need to be reminded that God is working on your behalf. He's faithful. He's good. Maybe you came here with a heavy heart. Maybe you came here wondering how, what tomorrow holds. Maybe you came here wondering how you're going to be able to provide. If he's been faithful back then, he'll be faithful today. If he's been faithful yesterday, he'll be faithful tomorrow. You can trust in him. You can lean on him. He will take care of you. This morning, I'm going to invite you to examine your attitudes your actions, your affections from this past week. If there's anything in your life that's not like Jesus, that dishonored Jesus, would you quickly repent and come to the throne of grace? As you come to the table, be reminded that this table is a place where grace flows abundantly into your life. No matter how bad you screwed up, His grace is bigger. His grace is sufficient. There's a God that loves you. There's a God that takes care of you. There's a God that provides for you. This morning as we come to the table, if there are things in your life that you need to make right with God, I'm going to invite you to do that. And when you're ready, the table, the elements will be ready for you to come and pick up. The way we do communion here at our church, you pray. When you're ready, you grab the elements and you come back to your seat. Then I'll come up here in a few moments and we'll partake of it together. But examine your heart. Examine your attitudes. Examine your affections. See if there's anything unlike Jesus. Maybe this morning you come here worried about your future. And what you need to hear this morning is God will take care of you. Maybe this morning you're here wondering what's going to happen. And you need to hear God has your back. He will take care of you. Father, this morning, as we come, we come humbly recognizing that there is nothing good in us that deserves, that makes us qualified to be your sons and your daughters. It wasn't anything about us. It was simply the grace of God. You were merciful. You were loving. You loved us even before we loved you. When we were your enemies, you intervened in our lives. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your goodness. We love you this morning. In Jesus' name.